And today we want to turn our attention to the United States Canal Project. We want to take a look at how Panama became independent. And it was actually uh, on this day back in 1903 that Panama gained its independence from Colombia. And I will talk a little bit about how that rather ignominious act occurred. And we'll look then at how the pathway was then cleared for the beginning of the U.S. Canal Project in 1904, a project that would last for the better part of a decade and would be completed in August of 1914, just as the First World War was beginning in Europe. What I'd like to do today, if the technology cooperates, is to have us begin with a wonderful video that was put together by David McCullough, the award-winning author of Path Between the Seas, the Panama Canal, 1870 to 1914. For his work, he won the National Book Award. Of course, David McCullough won the Pulitzer Prize for his work on Truman. He won other National Book Award uh, awards and Pulitzer Prizes for a variety of others, including John Adams. But what we want to look today at is a, is a video that he uh, narrates and actually created that considers the Panama Canal. And it was at a period prior to the actual turnover of the canal from the United States to Panama on December 31st, 1999. And so it was at a va rather interesting moment there were questions about whether that actual handover would take place, and it did without incident. And so let's begin today with David McCullough's broad overview of the Panama Canal. It begins with the French project, goes through and gives a very uh, majestic <laughs> overview of the U.S. Canal project, and then finishes with the author's commentaries. So let me get this started for us. Dawn, nine degrees north of the equator, a crossroads of the world, and one of the most extraordinary human achievements of all time, the Panama Canal. A 50 mile shortcut to the Pacific that changed the course of history. I'm David McCullough. The Panama Canal was built in the 1880s, and had it been built somewhere else, somewhere safe and convenient, in Ohio, say, it still would have been the engineering marvel of the age. Its magnitude was so great, its ingenuity so remarkable. But here was the place to join the oceans, Panama. And Panama then, is one of the most difficult and deadly terrains anywhere on Earth. And it's this, quite apart from its importance as a world thoroughfare, that makes the Panama Canal such an extraordinary story. Cristobal Signal, Cristobal Signal, Royal Viking Sea. Our ETA to the breakwater is 0600. Every engine you are scheduled to get pilot at the breakwater entrance. Every day, ships of every kind from every country line up for their turn, according to instruction. Passage begins at the Great Gatun Locks, the Caribbean entrance to the canal, a turn-of-the-century triumph that was built to last. When you think of all that they didn't have, no bulldozers, no chainsaws, no modern medicines, they were far ahead of uh, themselves and uh, the technology at that time. Uh, they must have had a view into the future. The engineering of the country is just fantastic. Permanece 
ships do we have going through today? Well, so we far. have quite a few southbound, Captain. Yeah. A couple of big ones in there. Yeah. Clear immigration for customs. Yeah. For most present-day ships of the sea, the locks offer little room to spare. Every move is as practiced as a dance step. Hey, Rule, I have to make a wide approach and I keep the stern off, so let me know how she looks on that knuckle. Get up close. Okay, what is it? One voice commands. The pilot. Midship. Midship. As many as six electric locomotives guide the ship through the locks. You can let go there now. Hard to port again, please. Hard bubble. One center, pick up your slack. Okay, Mahaffey. Let me know when the shoulder's inside the knuckle, please. You got about uh, 100 feet more to go, right? Okay, starboard engine dead slow ahead. Dead slow ahead. Uh, very good way for you one side. It isn't just a big trench, this canal. It's not like what many imagine. A ship doesn't simply sail through Panama at sea level. It is raised by a system of locks to the level of a large man-made lake. giant water elevator or water steps that lift ships a total of 85 feet as high as a seven-story building passage from sea to sea is really up and over Panama this is the genius of the engineering The locks are among the most massive structures ever built, and the most interesting. Far more goes on here than meets the eye, since so much is hit below water. Half miles, South 16 Zulu, 16 Zulu transfer, clear of that tomb. The canal was the moonshot of its era, and as so often happens in great enterprises, success or failure turned time and again on the elusive factor of personality. The story begins in Paris in 1879. Experiment and innovation are signs of the times. It is the Paris not just of Monet and Offenbach, but of Eiffel, Pasteur, Jules Verne, and of the beloved Count Ferdinand de Lesseps, builder of the Suez Canal. He is vivid, vital, ageless at 74. His triumph in Egypt 10 years earlier was cause for huge celebration. Verdi composed Aida in honor of the occasion. To his countrymen, de Lesseps is le grand Francais, the great Frenchman. He had defied the experts who said the task at Suez was too big, and he succeeded with an unobstructed 105-mile passage dug through the Egyptian sand at sea level. He was also married a second time that same year of 1869 to a beautiful young woman who produced 12 children, an achievement considered in some circles more remarkable even than his Suez Canal. At an international conference at the Société de Géographie in Paris, he revealed his plan. He will give the world another canal complete the circle begun at Suez with a canal through Colombia's Isthmian province of Panama. On a voyage from New York to San Francisco, it will save 8,000 miles compared to rounding the Horn of South America. His route will follow the Little Panama Railroad,
just 50 miles from sea to sea. On paper, it looks easy. The distance is half Suez. Panama, he says, is the one place in Central America where a canal at sea level, like Suez, is possible. De Lesseps has never been to Panama, nor is he an engineer. He is a master entrepreneur of boundless confidence. His friend Jules Verne has said, Ferdinand has the genius of will. Then, as if in a play or a novel, a man rises to say any plan to dig a sea level canal at Panama is doomed. He is Godin de Lepinay, a French engineer who has had experience working in tropical America. Panama is a death trap, he says. It is poisoned with disease. Even so, he has an ingenious plan. Amazingly, he describes the canal that will one day be built canal with locks and a large artificial lake. But his audience thinks the idea preposterous. De Lesseps is the man of the hour. He will lead the glorious Panama enterprise. He will go to the people of France for the money. He will go to Panama. The wonder is the French accomplished all they did. They faced a wilderness as dangerous as it was beautiful. There was sawgrass that could shred skin like a razor. Smothering heat day after endless day, and mud and swamp. Days and nights a living hell by ticks, chiggers, spiders, ants, mosquitoes, and flies. The men worked in constant fear of poisonous snakes. And there was the rain. Panama has just two seasons. On his few visits, Ferdinand de Lesseps came and went only in the lovely dry season. Nothing could have been more different from the arid wastes of Suez. There was much too much water everywhere. The looping Chagres River could rise 40 feet in 24 hours. The half dozen settlements along the line were primitive at best with precious few comforts of home. But for many of the first French workers to arrive, there was high romance in such adventure in a strange and distant land. They began by clearing a path several hundred feet wide the whole way across the isthmus, cutting the jungle by hand, a tremendous task in itself. They made test borings, calculated the volume of excavation to be done. Then the digging began. to do about the Chagres River, which would have to be crossed repeatedly, and no one seriously thought the job would be easy. But then no one contemplated failure either. Their faith in progress was total. Lesseps promised that as problems arose, men of genius would step forward to solve them. Science would find a way. Wasn't this the 19th century? So morale was high, pride and confidence built by the kinds of equipment being marshaled for this, the greatest constructive undertaking ever attempted. The engineers and technicians were rigorously trained and as fine as any in the world. The maps and records they produced are invaluable to this day. Every month brought more of them. And they died as if in war. They died of smallpox, typhoid, snake bite, food poisoning. The vast majority died of malaria and the dreaded fievre jaune, yellow fever. Still others followed bravely to take their place, all for the glory of France. 
One ambitious young engineer who was to play a large part in the story, Philippe Bunavarilla, said, We are soldiers under fire. Let us think only of the fight tomorrow and of victory. Harper's Weekly posed a question. Is Ferdinand de Lesseps a canal digger or a grave digger? The mortality rate among hospital patients was three out of four. Of the first group of French nuns on the hospital staff, 24 Sisters of Charity, two survived. The pretty little French hospital on the slopes of Ancon Hill overlooking Panama City was well equipped and well staffed. But there were no screens in its shuttered windows and in the gardens, flowering plants were protected from the ravages of ants by crockery ring filled with water. A perfect arrangement, it so happens, for breeding the mosquito then called Stegomaya fasciata, the carrier of yellow fever. The danger of the handsome creature was not yet understood, or the peculiar fact that its ideal breeding place is in fresh water held in artificial containers. The cause of yellow fever, like malaria, was believed to be the noxious vapors of decaying waste and vegetation. Doctors advised newcomers to avoid the night air. 1886, Ferdinand de Lesseps, now 80 years old, arrived again to declare unequivocally that the canal would be built. He posed with his devoted engineers, resplendent in the kafia of an Arab sheik, a memento of his glory days in Egypt. The old hero put on a brave show but time was running out. His engineers had the facts. Costs were out of hand, the work woefully behind, beset now by terrible mudslides. The longer the digging went on, the more it seemed they had to do. No way had been found to cope with the Chagres River. Part of the problem was the kind of training the French engineers had received. They had been taught to achieve solutions by computation, they had never learned to improvise in the way that seemed second nature to American engineers. Of the death toll, scarcely a word was said. In the plaza at Panama City, thousands stood in the broiling sun for a chance to cheer Ferdinand de Lesseps. They never achieve anything who do not believe in success, he liked to say. The French were 10 years in Panama, during which they lost 20,000 lives, perhaps even more than that. But the death toll was not what stopped them. The money ran out. The size of the task was simply too great for private financing. No matter the charm and optimism of Ferdinand de Lesseps, no matter the dedication of the French engineers. Had de Lesseps not insisted on a canal at sea level, maybe things might have turned out differently but he tried to repeat his success at Suez here under conditions that were entirely different. He ignored his best advisors. He discounted reality. The collapse of his canal company when it came in 1889 was the biggest financial failure in history until then. Thousands of trusting investors lost their life savings. The government at Le Grand Francais ended his days in disgrace a dim old figure tucked away in a country house. For years afterward in France, the very word Panama was to mean swindle, wasted lives, unspeakable national disgrace. All that was true, but there were other reasons for the failure, reasons beyond anyone's control. The French effort simply came too early. The technology needed, as well as the medical science, just wasn't ready in time. Still, the French did about a third of the job needed for a Panama Canal. They were the pioneers. Late in the summer of 1901, 12 years after the bankruptcy of the French Canal, an assassin's bullet ended the life of President William McKinley. All at once, America had a new leader, Theodore Roosevelt.
Now look, said Senator Mark Hanna, that damn cowboy is President of the United States. Roosevelt, the youngest chief executive ever, had much he wanted to do. He believed in sea power as a ruling force in history. He dreamed of an American Navy commanding two seas, with an American canal in between. American engineers had already achieved amazing results with the building of the Western Railroads, the Brooklyn Bridge, and skyscrapers like New York's popular Flatiron Building. Once the Senate authorized the president to take up where the French had left at Panama, Roosevelt could hardly contain himself. But then Colombia began balking at the terms proposed, Panama still being very much part of Colombia. And it looked as though negotiations might drag on interminably. What resulted was the so-called Panama Revolution of 1903. Staged by a half dozen prominent Panamanians with shrewd coaching from the French engineer Philippe Bunavarilla. Success was instant and bloodless because an American gunboat, Nashville, appeared on the scene in time to keep Colombia from landing troops, which Colombia had every right to do. The whole affair was over in less than a day. Panama knew which flag to wave. No president had ever exercised gunboat diplomacy in such flagrant fashion or made the work of the cartoonists quite so easy. For a while, Roosevelt tried to defend his actions with legal arguments. Later, he dropped the pretense and told an adoring crowd, I took the isthmus, started the canal, and then left Congress not to debate the canal, but to debate me. On Wednesday, November 18, 1903, in a house on Lafayette Square, two men sat down to sign a new canal treaty, Secretary of State John Hay and the ever-resourceful Buna Varilla, who had now managed to have himself made Panama's special envoy to Washington. No Panamanians were present for the historic moment. For a compensation of $10 million, the United States was empowered to build a canal through a new canal zone and had the right to act as if sovereign within that zone in perpetuity, meaning forever. It was all anyone in Washington could have hoped for, yet hardly so in Panama. As John Hay conceded privately, there were many points to which a Panamanian patriot could object, but the bargain was already signed and sealed. The first year of the American effort was a fiasco. There was no organization, nobody had a plan, nobody seemed to know what to do. The food was bad, morale was terrible. When yellow fever broke out, hundreds fled for their lives, as the French had. Nor was their attitude helped much when the new chief engineer arrived on the scene. He was an American named John Findlay Wallace. He came with his wife, and they brought with them two metal caskets. Within about a year, during which almost nothing of any value happened, John Findlay Wallace quit, which was the best thing he could have done, because it meant the appointment of a new chief engineer. He was John Stevens, a big, hard-driving man with a blunt frontier manner and a reputation at age 52 as the finest railroad engineer in America. He had built the Great Northern through the Rockies. He told the men he wanted all excavation stopped. The first step was to make it a fit place to live. They liked him at once. In less than two years, he worked something of a miracle on the isthmus and saved the canal from almost certain disaster. To Army Dr. William Gorgas, Stevens was an act of providence. Unlike the French, Gorgas now knew that yellow fever and malaria are carried by mosquitoes. He had proved the point by eradicating the yellow fever mosquito in Havana after the Spanish-American War, working with Dr. Walter Reed. But in Panama, he'd been able to accomplish almost nothing. He had no money to work with, no official support in Washington. One powerful admiral, whose medical ideas were as out of date as his mutton chop whiskers, knew absolutely that mosquitoes had no connection with tropical fevers and refused to allocate money for window screens. Now, Gorgas was to have whatever he needed to clean up the place. He found himself leading the most costly, concentrated health and sanitation campaign the world had yet seen. 
Orders went out for 1,000 brooms, 4,000 buckets, carbolic acid, mercurial chloride, 8,000 pounds of common soap, 120 tons of insecticide. Stevens personally signed requisitions for $90,000 worth of wire screens. Cleanup brigades were recruited. It was an all-out assault on pestilence of every kind, using every known technique. Houses were fumigated from top to bottom. Drainage ditches swept clean. Streets were torn up for new sewers. Streets and sidewalks were paved for the first time. The contrast could be dramatic. Pipe water was provided and sanitary drinking cups. Brush was cleared from living areas, swamps, and marshlands drained. Oil was sprayed to check the breeding of Anopheles, the malaria mosquito. First things came first, before the digging. Living quarters went up. Clubhouses, commissaries, whole communities offering most all the modern conveniences in a tropical wilderness 2,000 miles from home. Stevens wanted nothing fancy, just accommodations good enough to attract the kinds of skilled men he knew he would need. Married men, preferably, and life made pleasant enough for them so they would want to stay for the long haul. His workers were soon enjoying such luxuries as fresh eggs, lettuce, even ice, a bakery was built, capable of producing 4,000 loaves of bread a day. He knew how big his workforce would have to be before the job was over. It was John Stevens who saw the real lesson of the French experience, the futility of trying to dig all the way down to sea level. It was John Stevens who best explained to Theodore Roosevelt how a lock and lake canal would bridge the isthmus and make a virtue of Panama's phenomenal rainfall by damming the Chagres River and creating a man-made lake. This way, most of the digging would be concentrated at Calabra Cut, the point where the canal cut through the highest ground. Roosevelt could now picture how a ship would be lifted up to the lake through a series of locks like steps. The system was brilliant because it was so simple. Each chamber would fill by a flow of water from the lake above. The one force at work was simple gravity. No pumps were required. Roosevelt might have insisted on a sea level canal, what many in Washington wanted. But he listened to Stevens and well he did. Had the United States tried to build a sea level canal, the project almost certainly would have failed. Stephen's great creative contribution to the engineering of the job was a system of railroads that probably no one else could have devised. A project intended for ships became one of the biggest railroad undertakings of all time. He knew the real task was not the digging, but hauling the dirt. This meant moving it by rail, hauling freight, he brought in bigger equipment than the French ever had, and far more of it. By his system, the dirt trains rolled endlessly. The objective was to keep the steam shovels working without pause. To keep pace with the shovels, tracks for the trains had to be moved again and again by brute labor, until a steam contraption called a track shifter was improvised to pick up and swing whole sections at once, doing the work of 400 men. The trains were made up of flat cars with only one side. At the dumping grounds, a three-ton steel plow was hauled forward from the head of the train by a big winch that took its power from the locomotive. So a 20-car train could be unloaded with a single sweep. The spoil, as they called it, was hauled off to build the immense earth dam at Gatun. damming of the Chagres River would create the largest man-made lake in the world. At the extreme ends of the canal, pilings for huge breakwaters were sunk. 
then filled in with tons of rock and dirt. Towns were to be built on hundreds of acres of landfill. By December 1905, Gorgas was able to announce there was no more yellow fever on the isthmus. It was hard to believe, but true. The year after, Stevens had 24,000 men at work, and Theodore Roosevelt decided to come look things over. It was the first time a president had ever left the country while in office, and Roosevelt loved every minute. There were even horsemen dressed up like rough riders to make him feel at home. He came in November, the peak of the rainy season, because, he told reporters, he wanted to see conditions at their worst. In three days, he traveled up and down the whole 50-mile route of the canal. He talked strategy with Stevens. He posed for a famous picture at the controls of a 95-ton Bucyrus shovel, mainstay of the work. He wanted to know everything about everything, to hear what the men had to say. He told them, you are doing the biggest thing of the kind that's ever been done, and I wanted to see how you were doing it. once something entirely unexpected happened. John Stevens quit. Nobody could quite believe it, and to this day his reasons remain a mystery. It was said that he had become bored with the work once he had everything running so smoothly. It was said he had uncovered some terrible scandal and therefore wished no more association with the work. It was said he missed his family, that he wanted more money, that in fact he disliked Theodore Roosevelt. The best evidence is that he was overworked and broke under the strain. In any event, an extremely angry Theodore Roosevelt, determined to have no more chief engineers walking off the job, appointed a man who couldn't quit, an army officer, Colonel George Washington Goethals. Goethals was a different sort from Stevens. Stevens was informal, often profane. He dressed in old overalls, boots, and a battered felt hat. Gothels was spotless, a picture of West Point formality, even in civilian clothes. To many, he seemed a cold fish. His staff, beside Dr. Gorgas, now included two other important Army engineers, and they were assigned two colossal tasks. Colonel David Gayard would command the excavation at Calabra Cut. Colonel William Seibert was to build the Gatun locks. Gothel Dr. Gorgas were at odds almost immediately. Gothels, concerned about cost efficiency, thought the sanitation campaign was badly managed under the easy-going Gorgas and made a study to prove it. Do you know, Gorgas, he said, that every mosquito you kill costs the United States government ten dollars? But just think, Gorgas replied, one of those ten dollar mosquitoes might bite you, and what a loss that would be to the country. The sanitation campaign continued as before. Gothel's value was enormous. He ran things magnificently. He and the other Army engineers had built locks and dams before on American rivers. Their professional background could not have been more appropriate. Again, as in the French time, everything came by ship, including those who would do the heaviest work except now they came mainly from Barbados, sometimes a thousand or more on a single ship. For them, no special accommodations were provided. The pay, however, was considered excellent. 10 cents an hour for a 10-hour day, six days a week. The main point of battle was Calabra Cut, a nine-mile gouge through the high ground where 30 years before the French had concentrated much of their effort. A visitor wrote, he who did not see the Calabra cut during the mighty work of excavation missed seeing the great spectacles of the ages. 
With the work at full blast, the United States was digging the equivalent of a Suez Canal every three years. In any one day, there were 50 to 60 steam shovels in the cut. Along the entire line, about 200 train loads a day were being hauled to the dumps. By noon, temperatures at the bottom of the cut hovered around 120 degrees. One steam shovel operator remembered it as Hell's Gorge. Death and injury were commonplace. Men were caught beneath the wheels of trains or struck by flying rock or blown to bits. Dynamite got tender from standing too long in the sun. One premature explosion killed 23. In total, more explosive energy was expended in blasting through Panama than in all the wars the United States had fought until then. There was rain and rain and more rain. And the mountains began to slide. Avalanches of mud and rock plunged to the bottom of the cut Steam shovels crushed like toys. Miles of track were obliterated. In 1912, after one of the worst slides on record, Colonel Gayard was beside himself. Gothels was caught on the scene. What are we going to do now, said Gayard. Dig it out again, said Gothels. The deeper the cut went, the worse the slides became. One man described digging through the unstable geology of Panama as like running your hand through a bin of grain. The more you dug, the more came down. Engineers talk of the angle of repose, that point at which a slope has been cut back far enough so that nothing will come sliding off. Unfortunately, that ideal state has never been attained here. Landslides are still a problem. Life in construction days became highly stratified and not without its compensations for the engineering officers at the top level. At the bottom level were the ordinary day laborers, all foreign. By 1912, the workforce numbered 50,000. Less than 10%, however, were Americans. Most were English-speaking West Indians. The dividing line couldn't have been clearer. Foreign, black workers were paid in silver. American, white employees got gold. Beyond payday, everything else was demarcated according to gold and silver. As in much of America then, all was quite separate and seldom equal. The Americans were the locomotive engineers, surveyors, machinists, electricians, and foremen. They were the school teachers, nurses, police and paymasters. The pay was good. Clerks and bookkeepers started at $100 a month. A graduate civil engineer at $250. A steam shovel engineer got $310, plus the glory of the job. There were baseball leagues, concerts, outings at the beach, and lazy Sundays. For most, it was the time of their lives. As work proceeded on the Great Locks, the true grandeur of the canal's concept became apparent as never before. sites looked like something from the time of the pharaohs, or as D.W. Griffith would have filmed the pharaohs. To deliver the wet concrete, a spectacular cableway was devised with 85-foot towers on tracks so they could be moved as the work progressed. 
Sand, gravel, and Portland cement were fed into a mixing plant by one automatic railroad, while another carried full bucket loads to the cableway, where they sailed off to their destination at a speed of 20 miles an hour. For the locks on the Pacific side, tremendous cantilever cranes were used instead of a cableway. But the idea was the same, to keep the work area free of everything except the big steel forms within which the concrete was poured. Unlike the pyramids or the Great Wall of China, these monumental structures were no mere matter of putting stone on stone. They had to be built first in the negative with the forms. All the locks were constructed in 36-foot sections. The big forms, also on tracks, would then be moved to the next position. And since numerous inner chambers, passageways, and culverts were required, the job was anything but simple. The volume of concrete poured for the Gatun locks alone, somebody figured, was enough to build a wall 8 feet thick, 12 feet high, and 133 miles long. No structure in existence contains such a quantity of material, Colonel William Seibert very proudly. With an overall length of 1,000 feet and a width of 110 feet, each lock was considerably bigger than a ship the size of the Titanic. In fact, a single lock chamber, if stood on end, would have been the tallest structure in the world, taller than the Eiffel Tower, taller even than the new Woolworth building. One lock chamber could have held three Statues of Liberty, end to end, with room to spare. The water was to flow in and out of the chambers through main culverts as big as railroad tunnels. The valves in these main culverts were composed of twin gates that weighed 10 tons apiece. The giant steel gates were by far the largest ever built. The gate leaves weighed 700 tons on the average, but were hollow, constructed like ships, so they would be buoyant once the water was in. With all their moving parts, the locks will be giant machines. An idea of how much industrial technology was involved is in a single statistic. In the city of Pittsburgh alone, 50 different mills, foundries, machine shops, and specialty fabricators were contracted to produce the rivets, nuts, bolts, steel girders, steel plates, forms, and roller bearings to make the gates, which were then shipped to Panama in pieces. On May 20, 1913, two steam shovels, as battered as if they'd been through a war, met at the bottom of Calabra Cut and sounded their whistles. The canal was as deep as it would go. The last concrete was laid at the locks on May 31, 1913, and with Gatun Dam nearly finished, whole towns along the canal route were now being taken down, struck like stage sets, and carried off. Once Gatun Lake was filled, generators at Gatun Dam would produce the electricity to operate the locks. So, the canal would provide its own power. And with the end of the task now so nearly in sight, Panama became a number one attraction for tourists. They came by the thousands. One was 10-year-old Charles Lindbergh Jr. traveling with his mother. Remembering his excitement years later, Lindbergh would write, The very name America made one think of miracles. We had conquered a continent. We had abolished slavery. We had developed the automobile. We had invented the airplane. And now, we were building the Panama Canal. The first trial locked Gatun was made by the Tug Gatun in October. The grand opening came the next summer, August 15, 1914, when the steamer Ancon crossed to the Pacific. 
Almost inconceivably, the canal had been finished ahead of schedule, and it cost less than estimated. No corruption of any kind was connected with the work, a phenomenal feat, and largely because of the leadership of Jothels. But no single construction effort in American history had exacted such a price. The cost was $352 million. French and American expenditures together totaled $639 million. In present money, more than $7 billion. The human cost since 1904 was 5,609 dead, of whom not less than 4,500 were black workers. The canal was open to the world, and in time came the ships of the world. Everything from square riggers to submarines. There was J.P. Morgan's yacht Corsair, the liner Croonland, and the Empress of Britain. The passage of American battleships from sea to sea left no doubt that Theodore Roosevelt's dream had come true. Roger, Trinidad, South 16 Zulu, vessel goes to sea. We have no harbor and no north. Some operations today, like the traffic control center, would baffle the original builders. Yet most are essentially the same as when the canal opened. The complete 50-mile crossing takes approximately nine hours. On the Pacific side, banks are divided. First at Pedro Miguel, then Miraflores. More than 2,000 ships a year rank now as Panamax size, as large as the canal can handle. Many barely fit through. Shortly before the canal was finished, a fine arts commission was dispatched from Washington to see in what ways the appearance of the canal might be dressed up or improved upon. The conclusion was to do nothing. The canal would look as its builders intended, no less, no more. In all, it was a masterpiece unlike any other. In the control tower at Miraflores, as at all the control towers of the canal, operators open and close the lock gates, lift or lower ships, the skyscrapers, with a turn of the hand. Pointers stand open as the gates stand open, awaiting the ship's arrival for its descent to the Pacific. Everything that is happening outside happens on the board, at the corresponding place, and at the same time. As water in the chamber goes down to lower the ship, a water level gauge descends. As the water flows into the next chamber, rising to equalize the two levels, a gauge marks its progress. They were very smart people, an engineer at Miraflores once told me. To transit the Miraflores locks takes 45 minutes. At high speed, it looks like this. ever collected was for the Queen Elizabeth II, $99,000. The smallest was for Richard Halliburton, the world traveler and author. In the 1920s, he swam the canal from end to end. The charge was 36 cents. The toll for this ship, the Royal Viking Sea, is about $44,000.
The canal remains one of the busiest sea lanes in the world. It carries crude oil, steel, lumber, Japanese automobiles, Canadian wheat, Italian marble, everything from nails to jet fuel to coffee and bananas. As of the year 2000, actually, as of noon, December 31st, 1999, the canal will belong to Panama. Panama alone will operate the canal, which, according to the agreement, will remain a neutral waterway open to all nations. The United States will have the permanent right to protect and defend that neutrality. Whether the canal will be operated as efficiently as it has been in years past, or better, is a question nobody can answer. But to no country is its continued usage and proper maintenance more important than to Panama. Strung out over 50 miles, the canal is a huge, costly industrial complex operating night and day. Its chief assets are its workforce, some 8,000 people, most of whom are Panama, and the simple element of water. Too much water had been the main obstacle at the beginning, and water, all that magnificent Panama rain, turned out to be the very thing that made the canal possible. Every one of the 12,000 ships or more that take the Panama Passage each year means the expenditure of 52 million gallons of fresh water flushed from the lake through the locks and out to sea. The canal functions because the supply of water from the rainforest is never ending and should continue to be so as long as the rainforest is kept intact. The cycles of nature make it a kind of colossal perpetual motion machine. The need for a ship passage here at the Isthmus of Panama was as plain as day as early as the 16th century. A Spanish priest writing to his king said, there are mountains and there are hands, meaning the task is huge, but with enough will it can be done. Yet even in the late 19th century, nearly 400 years later, the task proved insurmountable. The obstacles of disease, climate, geology, the sheer magnitude of the work, not to mention the cost, were all too much. The French had all the will in the world, but that wasn't enough. Their timing was off. Science and technology change history, and never more so than in our own time. But science and technology are also the creations of history, and they do not advance in isolation. Had it not been for the Spanish-American War, the breakthrough discoveries on yellow fever would not have been available for application at Panama. Had it not been for the massive railroad construction across North America after the Civil War, there would have been no such resourceful figure as John Stevens with his technological mind to step forward and set things smoothly running at Panama. All the electrical components of the locks, the electrical engineering, would not have been available had the canal been only a dozen years earlier. As it was, the timing for success right at the start of the new century was exactly right. Theodore Roosevelt never saw the Panama Canal. He died in 1919, but he was sure it was what history would remember him longest for. William Gorgas was Surgeon General in the First World War and was later knighted by King George of England for his great work for humanity. George Gothels was Quartermaster General of the Army in the First World War. John Stevens went to Russia in 1917 at the request of President Woodrow Wilson to reorganize the Trans-Siberian Railroad, an assignment of five years. Once, he returned to Panama by Pan American Clipper. Asked what about the trip gave him the biggest thrill, he said the ride on the airplane. Of the others, the tens of thousands who were there when the canal was built, nearly all are long gone now. Gothels, when once asked what the secret of success had been, answered, the pride everyone feels in the work.
fantastic. Well, I have to say, I never tire of seeing as majestic a story as that. It is absolutely phenomenal. And likewise, in the many opportunities that I've had to transit the canal, I am amazed every time. And these stories of the individuals who were involved resonate with me when I think of the effort expended and the genius required to produce something such as the Panama Canal. So here we are on the day of Panamanian independence. And I just wanted to leave us with a few points that are germane to what we saw with David McCullough. You know, I remember when I taught in Panama that I was told this isn't a day of celebration, Independence Day. And in fact, one of the faculty members in the Department of History at the University of Panama said, it's interesting. There are no heroes when it comes to Panamanian independence. It's not something that we look back to as some golden moment. And so I want to just quickly reference a few things here. Um, that I think are, are critically important. And the first is, and the reason that that comment was made, that there are no heroes, is tied to the fact, and David McCullough referenced it, so independence came today. And there had been prior attempts at secession in Panama, number of them amounting to much. But the arrival of the USS Nashville blocked any Colombian attempts to quash this rebellion. A number of well-connected, influential Panamanians had come together in a conspiracy. Now, there's an interesting story that there were Colombian troops on the ground and a very fast thinking engineer, the Panama Railroad, had convinced the Colombian general to go ahead from Colon to Panama City by himself and that they would arrange to have his troops brought over later. <laughs> it didn't happen. They made sure that that didn't take place. The second thing, the Panamanian troops that were in Panama City, there was a massive bribery that took place and the commanders, essentially the Colombian commanders were paid off. The Colombian troops that were on the ground ended up returning to Colombia proper by, via a British mail steamer that brought them back home. There were as David McCullough said, no casualties except one. From, from what I saw in the archives, there had actually been five shots fired and there was an elderly Chinese street vendor who was killed. So, independence. The question was now, what would happen? Immediately, Colombia protested and the United States was first to recognize this independence. Representing this group of well-connected families was the minister plenipotentiary, uh, Bunal Varela. And so Bunal Varela, who had such an interest in the French project and had uh, a number of financial concerns when this, when, you know, was trying to find a buyer for the French venture. He 
goes to Washington, spends time in New York as well, shuttles back and forth, and it is he who sits down with John Hay and comes up with the hay bunau varilla Treaty. The United States got more than it had ever imagined. So, it was given full control and management over a future canal project. And here's the thing, in the hay bunau varilla Treaty, which was in essence part later on of the Constitution that would govern Panama, it says clearly that the United States had the authority to act, quote, as if it were sovereign, end quote. The original canal zone was to be held by the U.S. in perpetuity. That was later changed to 999 years and then changed again to 99 years. So that's the key, as if it were sovereign. So when we look in the coming sessions at the debate over the Panama Canal treaties, many of those who argued vociferously that the United States had bought the canal, had bought the land, had built the canal, it was ours, it was ours failed to read the Hebel Nel Varilla Treaty or the Panamanian Constitution. Now, the United States was given hegemony, control over the isthmus, and it really made itself apparent early on in three key ways. First, a dual tier payroll system was constructed, whereby US citizens were paid in gold, all others were paid on the silver roll. There was a tremendous discrepancy in salaries, and an even greater discrepancy in benefits. Secondly, one of the things that the United States brought to Panama in the building of the project were conceptions of race that existed in the early 20th century in the United States. And you see in Panama the beginnings of uh, a Jim Crow legal structure whereby there was clear desegregation, there was clear segregation, a, a division of the races uh, in the same way that existed in the United States. And the final portion of this was the Monetary Convention of 1904. It made the United States dollar the legal currency in Panama, which of course it remains today. And so, all of these are things that gave the U.S. inordinate influence over future developments in Panama. The Monetary Convention of 1904 is what helped the United States government to put the squeeze on Manuel Noriega. The United States simply cut the flow of dollars into Panama to strangle the economy, and the effect was drastic and immediate. And so my point here is that from the outset, the United States, in a rather unhealthy way, becomes a mediator and a referee in Panamanian politics. There will be a recurring cycle. Elections are held. The losing party immediately cries foul, turns to the United States to come in and investigate the election results, meaning that the United States is in a rather unhealthy way, constantly involved in the internal politics of Panama. And this would play out over the decades after the opening of the canal in August of 1914. The only photo of the actual signing of the Hay will now Varilla Treaty. Of course, the myriad of political cartoons here, Theodore Roosevelt, the man who can make the dirt fly. Uh, just briefly, 
I wanted to reinforce a few of the things that you saw in the um, video. And I think clearly uh, David McCullough has uh, a special part in his heart for John Stevens and believes that without John Stevens' genius as a railroad engineer that the canal project wouldn't have come to fruition. So a dynamic 20 months where John Stevens was at the helm, he worked out making sure that the workers were cared for, he puts in the infrastructure, quits abruptly, and then is followed by Colonel George Washington Gothels. It's under Gothels that the uh, Gayard cut is finished through the Culebra cut, the damming of the Chagres River, and the formation of Lake Gatun. One of the other keys, as we saw, were the eradication efforts, particularly of William Crawford Gorgas. Gorgas would be the one who um, would put forward the efforts to eradicate the mosquitoes that cause both malaria and yellow fever on the isthmus. And then you've got the important role that the Afro-West Indian laborers played. It's often been referenced as black labor on a white canal, famous work written by uh, my uh, graduate school mentor, Michael Conniff, titled very same. Um, and from the outset, but particularly as the canal project began to wind down, and many of these Afro-West Indians settled in the terminal cities of Cologne in Panama City, there was Panamanian resentment. They felt that it drove up housing costs. They felt that this was an external element. They didn't speak Spanish. They weren't Roman Catholic. That they were not part of the Panamanian social fabric. And so um, just some of the things that come to mind in that regard. There are the two key chief engineers, John Stevens and George Washington Gothels. Uh, the Lock Canal, you saw how that um, operated. Um, there's some famous uh, memorabilia. This is when Theodore Roosevelt uh, came to Panama again. Height of the rainy season, he was there in November 1906. Stayed at the uh, Tivoli Hill, the Encon, in uh, the Canal Zone. The iconic photo of Theodore Roosevelt. Some of the other technologies employed, some of the things that stood out to me, things like the track shifter. The battles within the Calabra Cut, dealing with the landslides, perhaps the worst. Uh, was in 1912, um, and they basically had to dig it out again. Uh, the lock construction, phenomenal amount of concrete utilized in order to build these structures. And then the uh, disease eradication, uh, eradication efforts. Um, you see here Juan Carlos Finlay and William Crawford Gorgas. Um, Carlos Juan Finlay was a physician in Havana. As you see here, first proposed as early as 1881 that yellow fever was a mosquito-borne illness. He was subsequently proven correct by Walter Reed and his colleagues. Uh, Sir Ronald Ross, a British physician in the Indian Medical Service, did a considerable amount of work on the transmitting agents of malaria and was actually awarded the Nobel Prize in 1902. And then, of course, Walter Reed, U.S. Army physician, led the Yellow Fever Commission to identify the transmitting agent, conducted experiments in Havana, 1900, after the Spanish-American War, in an effort to prove Carlos Finlay's vector theory. But the man of the moment undoubtedly was William Crawford Gorgas. And so in 1905, he used a vector control strategy um, to cleanse Havana, Cuba. 
And he used what he had learned there and brought it to Panama and applied his epidemiological control strategies there. And as you saw, it had to do with environmental modification, the uh, larvicides that were used to kill the mosquitoes, the spraying both indoor and outdoor, and then the use of a variety of materials, screens, the fumigation of houses, uh, the isolation of victims, replacing the standing water with running water, and then finally just some of the phenomenal uh, photos that were taken of the Afro-West Indians as they arrived in Panama coming from Barbados and Jamaica in particular. And here's the silver uh, car, the rail pay car that was um, to disseminate the pay for the um, non-U.S. workers uh, in Panama. An amazing story for sure. And I wanted to use today as that tipping point where we actually look in depth at the canal, the construction of the canal, what was involved with it, so that in our next session we can begin with the history of independent Panama and Panama operating with an actual functioning canal, which opens in 1914, and looking at developments in Panama from 1914 through to the present. But in the moment or two that we have left, are there any questions that you might have specific to what we looked at today? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the French company um, was, was paid, um, it was, I, I, if memory serves me, it was around $40 million for the, for the French uh, concession. So the French company was paid. Uh, they obviously had wanted more. The United States was in a better position of leverage because the material and the machines were in the jungle rusting away. So the French were fortunate to get what they could, but they were indeed paid for that. And the total investment uh, by the United States from beginning to end? Uh, well, um, I, in, I know that in today's dollars that the entire cost was somewhere between seven and eight billion. And so, um, you know, it was, I think, in the neighborhood of 500 to 600 million dollars at that time. Yes? When did that McCullough program first air? That was right around the late eight, just right around 1990, if memory serves me. The, it was then, it was in, in the old um, VHS form, and then it was converted into a DVD somewhere around uh, 2004. Yes. Can you explain why the payment in gold versus silver was such a big deal? Really yeah, well, it, 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 it sort of had to do with the symbolism more than anything else. Uh, and, I mean, clearly the U.S. workers were paid better. They were considered to have skill sets and expertise that would require that they be paid better. They were given uh, a package of benefits that in many cases, in cases, including housing, they were able to purchase their items in the canal zone at subsidized rates. So there were a whole series of benefits. But it was basically code for white workers and non-white workers. And so they used gold and silver to basically make that distinction. What bothered Panamanians greatly is that they didn't consider themselves to be non-white and yet were lumped into this silver pay, which in essence placed them in that category. And so you began to see as well um, facilities, restrooms, restaurants, commissaries, gold and silver.
basically it was white and black. Yes? To, to carry that uh, a couple of steps further, but as you pointed out, it was only symbolic. In the sense that a dollar was worth a dollar, whether it was a gold dollar or ten silver dimes. Correct. The other point is that none of the uh, Caribbean workers, certainly, were forced into work. They accepted the pay as being something that was more than they could get at home and sent the money back. So to say, to put this in terms of, uh, of uh, Jim Crow and so forth, is probably a little unfair. Admittedly, there was the difference uh, in terms of what, what was apparent uh -huh. from a side. But what I would say is, granted, so many of these workers left Barbados or Jamaica voluntarily, but they often left having been fed a lot of propaganda by recruiters in their home countries. Many of them were told that the living conditions where they were headed were better than were actually the case. If you look at the workers who die from various accidents, explosions, from the uh, landslides, by and large, 90% of those workers were Afro-West Indians. So they die in much larger numbers. They're paid 10 cents an hour for 10 hours a day. Their living quarters were, uh, were in some cases, just um, wooden dormitories where they were lucky to get a cot that wasn't wet. Um, and so while, while I think it is fair to say that they came of their own volition, many of them, when they realized what they had gotten themselves into, were looking to take the ne next ship back. To their credit, many stayed, and many were very proud of having been associated with this project. And they clearly saw this as the uh, greatest engineering feat in history and believe that they played an important role in it. Um, but I, when I say that it's, it's symbolic, it's symbolic, but it's also, uh, it goes beyond just the symbolism. It was the day-to-day -day realities. Most of the US workers had all the advantages of living in the canal zone that these Afro-West Indians didn't. So I do think that there is a distinction, but I, I would say that they're that they were voluntary workers who realized that they were making a better daily wage than they would have back in Barbados or Jamaica. And that's for sure. Thank you. My pleasure.